This is a 1996 Ranger 391 XT. Introduced in 1990, the 391 XT was manufactured in Flippin, Arkansas and measured 90 inches across the beam, 19 feet in length, and featured a 200 horsepower maximum rating. The 391 XT was one of the first boats Ranger ever produced that offered an optional extended flipping deck. The owner of this boat added his own extended flipping deck just a couple years ago and had a hard time matching that 25-year-old carpet. With its smooth dry ride and customizable colors, the Ranger 391 XT was a Cadillac in the early 90s. The 391 XT featured two rod lockers on both the port and starboard side and featured five large storage compartments so you could fit all your tackle and gear. One of the storage compartments on the 391 was right here conveniently located behind the seat and ran the width of the back deck, which was perfect for storing things like boat paddles, stern lights, measuring board, and something you never want to have to use, but sometimes you just got to, the good old TP right behind the driver's seat. The 391 was tournament ready with two deep live wells right behind the driver and passenger seat with easy access and featured a dial right on the console for your live well timer and two really easy valves to open and close the live well right next to the throttle. Something really cool for me on this boat when I was going over it is this right here. And a lot of you in different parts of the country won't know what this is. This is a black light jack. So in this part of the world, North Alabama, Southern Tennessee, night fishing is huge. So you would install a jack right here. Your black light had a little plug on it. You just pop it in. You use this TH Marine switch right here. Pop it on. And you can see your fluorescent line glow. The 391 XT is a grizzled veteran from the Ranger Boats product line and is a perfect choice for my guest today, Mr. Jason Christie, who has never won a penny competing from another bass boat brand. I'm Luke Duncan, and this is Boats and Pros. Looks like we got a, uh, a hitchhiker right down here. Look at this. Look at this, just standing outside the bathrooms, just waiting, just waiting for a ride. You lost? I am lost. <laughs> well, I got a ride for you. What do you think? Brings back some memories. <laughs> I told you I had a good one. Yeah. All these guys, they don't trust me. He thought I was gonna put him in a canoe or something. Then I show up. <laughs> Brings back some memory. I spent a lot of days in the 300 series. This is a 96 391 XT. Mm. And I mean, it's even got the mismatch car. Yeah, yeah, he got the extended flipping deck. And I was talking to a buddy of mine at Ranger. So this was the first model that you could actually get an extended flipping deck that they ever built. But uh, Mr. Myron, that let us borrow this awesome boat for today, just added it not long ago and they couldn't match the carpet up. Yeah. He told me, that's the only thing wrong with my boat is the carpet mis is mismatched. But uh, this one is, uh, it's a battleship, man. So oh. you fished out of one of these a few times oh, at 300 goodness. series. Yeah. yeah, It's a good shape, man. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's in really good shape. 25 years? Yeah, or got I'm not, few, I went to county school. I, yeah. I can't do math like that. Got a few like scratches that. on them, but that's it. Just a few. Let's put it in, see if she'll, uh, see if she'll float us. All right. You know what my daddy taught me? What's that? You never unhook the front until the tires hit the water. <laughs> <laughs> we, I've seen a lot of people send them on the ramp. I've had a lot of partners over the years that are like, hey, just unhook it. My daddy, Marty Duncan, he beat you over that. You know what? Let's make sure. She fires? Hang on. From the first two boats and pros, let me, I'm gonna hook it back up. <laughs> see if she'll start. <laughs> Did she fire? Just cool. like that, didn't she? I right. like a kitten. You good. Why is it colder at this Boats and Pros in March than it was in the January Boats and Pros? 
He's probably already caught three flipping that bush right there. Most likely. He's got his hot foot in the floor right here. Has he got a hot foot in there? Yeah. Oh, dang. He's ready to roll. He's even got TH Marine headlights. That's old school, man. Those, uh, they sold a blue million of those things in the 90s to all these night fishermen down here. I, don't, I didn't see them though. He may, he may have a jack for them though. Look at the old timer. Oh yeah. The old timer. All right, the rain let up, so we're out here now. And this thing is in really freaking good shape, man. It's uh, excellent condition for 25 years no old. No doubt about it. It's almost as old as I am. And that's, <laughs> uh, I was actually, no, yeah, I was 13. 13 when this boat was new. So it's, uh, it's been a minute. No comment on that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little older than you. Older. You're in a lot better shape than me. Yeah. You got them good jeans, man. You got, <laughs> you got good jeans. So you were telling us this 300 series, the 360s, this was what you fished out of the most. Yeah. That's actually the first time going fishing. Uh, I started fishing in the mid nineties and my uncles, we all ran Rangers. The whole family ran Rangers and that's what they had with 361s. and. And it was funny back then, you know, it brings back memories being in this boat, just the things that we did to the boat um, to try to outrun somebody else, you know. It's <laughs> like what? Wax the bottom. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. You wax the bottom before season, you wax the bottom in the spring, and if you had a hot spot, you wax the bottom. Really? Yeah, two mile an hour. No kidding. Mm -hmm. So that was like local fruit jar stuff. You're trying to beat people to the goods or is it just because the best part of bass fishing is the boat race? Why? Yeah, why? it was, uh, no, it was like team tournaments. You okay. know, you have like, I mean, back home, we had a lot of team tournaments back in the day that paid a lot of money. And that's yeah. how we made a living. I mean, that's how you supplemented the going to school and being a teacher. You know, you had to have some money on the side. So now, we, how, how old are you then? In the, so in the nineties, when you first really start making money tournament fishing, uh 20 18 20. to 20. okay you know that's whenever i started fishing a lot in those tournaments and i you know it was hard because of the schedule back then you know playing ball and then going directly from playing ball to coaching i mean i was always it was hard to miss um so i just pretty much had to show up on the weekends and fish i mean okay. i fished a lot after school and after practice but you get an hour or two here and there now is that mainly oklahoma stuff like grand yeah. lake of course Pink everybody Island. knows that's your grand right. lake's probably your favorite lake yeah, Ten Killer, Arkansas River. I mean, anywhere that they had a bass tournament back then, we went. But it was pretty much based in Oklahoma. And it was just you and your dad, or and your uh, uncle, or yeah, uncles. My dad had you know several brothers that fished, and okay. and uh, they're kind of the ones. And that was that was the good thing back then is you know he had four brothers that fished a lot, including my or five including my dad, and each one of them was really good at something. So I go fishing with my dad. I go fishing with one uncle, you know, who, who loved to throw a spinner bait. The other uncle loved to flip. I mean, so I got to learn from each one of those That's guys awesome, man. at a young age. So when did you first get? I, I'm, I'm always curious about this because, like, I started really being obsessed with bass fishing around the age of ten. But when would you say, man? this tournament thing was it then when you started fishing with your uncles or was it earlier like 10 or 12 years old when did you think that bass fishing tournaments were something that you were headed towards i don't think the tournament mindset really hit me until like 14 or 15 okay. but you know i can remember i actually remember going uh when i was six seven eight and mom and dad you know they'd get out of the truck they put the lawn chairs down they throw a minute out there crappie fishing and I'd do four laps around the cove bass fishing. Okay. Um, you know, and I, and I did that. I mean, we, we waded creeks, we, we fished ponds all the time, but you know, 13, 14, we had a little old city lake that you could only have water scamp. And I mean, we had three trolling motors on that thing. And, <laughs> and to us, it was, uh, you know, it was the biggest tournament ever. Oh, yeah. But I'll never forget, we, you know, we moved from where we lived until I was 13, we moved it was actually about 15. We moved to Lake Tenkiller, and I told Dad, I said, hey, you buy me a bass boat. I was winning a lot of that stuff on that city lake. I told Dad, I said, hey, you buy me a bass boat. I'll make us a little bit of money. He said, you know, son, he said, these boys over here, they, they serious. They, uh, they'll take your money. And I talked him into it. He bought a bass boat. He couldn't go with the first jackpot. And uh, we finished second, made $190. 
And the next morning when I got in that night, I laid that old envelope right there by his key so he could see it. And you know, the rest is kind of history. That's awesome. Yep. Dude, I, I love that stuff so much. So knowing, cause we all learn from somebody, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you're sound like me, you're fortunate enough to have family. My dad was, of course, my biggest influence in fishing and he fished tournaments a lot when I was a kid and, and then instilled that in me and got me bit by the bug. But you had yeah. a lot of teachers and that, I find that interesting that you're saying, you know, you have one uncle that's a spinnerbaiter, one yep. uncle that's flipping, that's so cool. And that's you, yep. that's your fishing DNA, man. That's so yep. awesome to know where that came from. I think it always follows. And I took, you know, I kind of, I was really fortunate to go fishing with them. And this is weird to say, but I was lucky that those guys kind of fought a little bit <laughs> because you'd have, you know, you'd have a team and then they'd get into it. So I'd be with this guy for a little while then I'd move to this guy, but uh, yeah. Now, I was, is that tempers? Is uh, that just, just, just just hard headedness just hard headed <laughs> you know and there was never you know here's fun, what's funny back then is there might be 50 boats in the tournament but i'd be with one uncle or i'd be with my dad and then there sets a boat right there with two other uncles and dude you don't care if you finish how you finish the tournament as long as you beat <laughs> those guys and you told everybody everything except for them <laughs> you know hey, I, really yeah i remember once we were fishing a tournament and and they and me two of my uncles they couldn't they couldn't go practice and i had the juice and i had kind of my secondary spot well i was nice enough to give them my secondary spot the juice wasn't working i went to the secondary about noon pulled in i said hey you guys got any oh we ain't caught nothing they already had 25 pounds <laughs> and uh that was that was pretty bad what was your first bass boat personally for you 461 461 ranger bought it with my own money and uh you know dad bought dad bought one for me uh a 461 off ot fears he bought uh, he didn't buy it for me he bought it for us we ran it for a few years but it was you know he bought that and the day that i graduated college i bought a 461 from an old uh, guy alan head and and uh, yeah, man I, I remember alan yeah, yeah. i love that boat and and uh, i kept that boat for four or five years. Really? Yeah, love. Probably it. won a lot of money out of it. I sounds did. Like. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, it was it was those single axle trailers. And like I said, being being in this boat just brings back a lot of oh, yeah. memories. This is this is such a just. It's like a piece of history. Yeah, and just the sound of that engine. Oh, I know. They, yeah, they don't sound like that yeah. anymore. Go, 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 go. I mean, and, and we're idling around talking, and that I know that brings back for me sitting there before blast off, yeah. listening to all those things and old club tournaments and different things. But um, so, talk a little bit about your basketball career, because and I know it's been it's been talked about and documented. But man, you were you got a scholarship to play ball, so yeah. this competitive thing has always been in you, but. When you were in college, were you bass fishing as hardcore then, I, or was it really after when you really got focused? No, absolutely. I mean, you know, the the basketball thing, I mean, we didn't have cell phones and stuff yeah. to keep our time. I mean, we, we were either in the woods or we were fishing. It didn't matter. You know, you get out of practice, high school practice at 5, and it got dark at 6. six. If you could sit in a deer stand for 30 minutes, you were going. Absolutely. Same way with fishing. And, and uh, man, I got... Whenever I was a senior in high school, I just didn't want to play in college. Didn't want to play, and you know the recruiters and stuff come in, and I just I turned them down. And it was it's funny how it worked. I had a college come in and uh, to recruit my teammate, and the coach asked us that day, you know, if we'd all show up so we could run up and down the floor. And after practice that day, the coach offered me a scholarship, <laughs> not my buddy, which I hated that. And uh, I went home and told my parents, I was like, hey, you know, this, this guy was a local school. He, he offered me a scholarship, but, you know, I'm not going to do it. And, and I could just see on their face, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. I mean, they, we, got what, I mean we got what we needed. But, uh, and I thought, you know, I can, ease, I can lessen the burden on them. And also, which is what's most important, I could play locally and they could go to the games. If my parents couldn't go to the games, I wouldn't play. That's awesome. And then, you know, to ask your, answer your question about, yeah, I fished all the time. I mean, it was in a newspaper, my college coach saying, my high school coach saying, if the guy spent as much time shooting a basketball as he did hunting <laughs> and fishing, he might make something out of his life. 
I wish well, I'd see him today. Hey, Coach. Yeah. I wish Maybe I'd... he'll see boats and pros. It <laughs> yeah. worked out okay for Jason Christie, yeah. Coach. If you're watching this, he's not playing for the Warriors or the yeah. Oklahoma City Thunder, but right. I think it, I think it's going to be all right. I think yeah. it's going to be. You, you've paid the mortgage a few times from catching bass <laughs> yeah, things, over the years. Things have been great. I was reading just bass pros are hard. To, it's hard to find dirt right that you don't know but i read something interesting to me and, you, and you've talked a lot about family already with us but tell me about your uncle duck because that name jumped out to me in an article and, and, and this article said you know it's just a generic question who's your who's your hero right. and you said duck so tell me about your uncle duck and and i know that duck has passed away right. but what 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 about duck made him special uh, other than his name being an awesome name just you talking about that and, and then his boat was the same color as this really instead of trimmed in red it was trimmed in blue it had blue carpet uh and he was the flipper and honestly you know what breaks my heart is is he was the biggest fan i had and and through family like my dad and my uncles they fished a lot of jackpots and team tournaments but he was the only one that was really he fished the old red man series okay you know? And uh, he fished, I don't know how many, I mean, I'd guess 200 of them, and he won one. And no telling how many times he finished second, third. And, and, you know, when I started fishing, you know, I was lucky enough to start winning those pretty consistently. And, and uh, the last year that he was alive, I was leading on Beaver for 200 grand. Had a pretty good lead going in the last day. This is probably going to sound like a broken record, but had a good lead going in the last day, and and he came to the weigh-in, and uh, I got beat. Didn't catch a lemon, and and uh, you know he told me he said, you know you just you kind of stay with it, and and it's going to work out one day. And he passed away in the fall, and that spring is when it all started. It's when the run started. You know I won and won my first big one and then it just seems like after that the next few years i couldn't do anything wrong and and uh but he was the one his biggest thing is just got to catch five so i practiced for an event once a team tournament that he couldn't go and i fished all day i caught there was a pocket that had boat docks around on fort gibson i caught a five pounder off one dock on a spook fished the rest of the day never got a bite morning we get there he goes all right what are we gonna do i said well i caught one fish in this pocket back then you went hoping to catch you yeah know? we go in that pocket we go all the way around that cove the last dock he fires a spook down the side of this dock catches a five pounder he gets it in i net it pull the trolling motor up and uh this this is this story just describes his mentality i pull the trolling motor up he goes where are you going I said, well, we fished all the way around. The, we're going to go somewhere else. He said, you fished the other day. You caught a five-pounder. We fished in here today, caught a five-pounder. Why are you going to leave fish? Two fish. Why are you going to leave fish to go find fish? So reluctantly, I hated it. Put the trolling motor back down. We fished in that pocket all day. About the size of a football. No, about the size of two basketball courts. Went around, 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 around. Had 23 pounds. Unbelievable. Caught five. You only got to catch five. We caught five and, uh, and 23 pounds. And your career has been that way. You're one grinder. of the guys, a grinder. You're grinder. a grinder. Like you, that's Swindle's favorite saying is grinder going to grind. But like, and Gerald's like that, but you are a grinder and you have weighed in unbelievable stringers, but you're consistent. It's, right. it's Andy Morgan. Wesley Strader, all these guys, they, they came up that way. That's, that's really cool to know that yeah. that's where he drilled that into your head, man. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that he's very proud. Oh, yeah. Sitting there watching you today, buddy. There's yeah, no and, doubt about that. You know, a lot of the credit seems like it goes to me, and it's really not. It goes, you know, it goes to those guys just for taking me fishing. Absolutely. You know, getting me in the boat and, and you know, making me love not only fishing, deer hunting, and, and uh, you know, the competitive thing. Not everybody has that. Luckily, we all had it. That's a that's and everybody awesome. has it at different levels, but I, I was lucky that those guys taught me that stuff. All right, so basketball is a huge part of your existence. Bass fishing, basketball, your girls are still real involved in basketball. It's me versus you, and we get to pick a teammate from the NBA all time. Doesn't matter who you're going with. Man, that's a hard one. I grew up watching 
Bird and Jordan. I mean, dude, I wore Air Jordans in school. I mean, I honestly think you jump higher with Air Jordans on. No doubt, me too. But saying that, and knowing how much I like to shoot the three, I'm gonna put somebody inside like uh, a Patrick Ewing. Okay. Where I can throw the ball into them, move over about six feet, knowing they're gonna throw the ball back to me and I get to shoot. <laughs> so, you, so you're out there at the three line. Oh yeah. See, I'm, uh, I've always been blessed to be really short. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, but uh, but I played forward when I was like in eighth grade, you know, so I'm, I'm getting, I'm- You I'm matured go, fast. I matured fast and, yep. then I, and I topped out. So I couldn't box out Patrick Ewing. So, so Knowing that, I gotta pick me a big guy now, don't I? Like I need like Dikembe or somebody. Yeah. Cause I was gonna go Jordan just because it's oh, yeah. like it's Jordan. You ain't gonna go wrong with that. Pick. You're not gonna go wrong with that pick, but I can't be if he ever misses. Right. I can't box out your guy. Well, and I feel like with Jordan, I ain't gonna get to shoot much. You're not gonna get to shoot. Right. Much. I no, want, he's gonna cover you up like white on rice. Yeah. I want. <laughs> I want to shoot it. So I'm gonna get me a big guy inside, and I'd go with a Hewing or uh, maybe even Shaq. Shaq can see. Oh, yeah. And Shaq can't. You know, Shaq can score, but. He's gonna kick it back out. He's going yeah, he's gonna kick it to you. Right. Perfect. And make you laugh. All right, so family family's obviously really important. Your uncle's got you into fishing, but you you are a girl dad. Man. You've got a house full <laughs> See that girl? That, that's where it comes from. I know. I got a daughter, and if I had three, I don't know what I would do. But I've seen pictures now. They grew up in the outdoors with you. They did. Um but they're all basketball players too. Talk a little bit about what that's been like, about being a girl dad and being a professional fisherman. But but because girls are, you know, people think Barbie dolls. They kind of put them in that right. in that deal. But I've seen your girls holding up yeah. big old bass and big big bucks. So talk about that a little bit. Man, I'll tell you, having girls, having a girl, and whenever you have three, it's one of the hardest things to do. I mean, it's it's hard, but it's the most rewarding you know it's there's nothing like i mean doesn't matter if you finish first in an event or at the bottom i always knew that when i come home and sit in the recliner they were going to climb up yeah. you're not you're not the professional fisherman you know you're the your dad your dad yeah and you know i was lucky enough that they you know they they enjoyed deer hunting whenever they're young fishing they they love that and and you know looking back i asked myself did they really enjoy it or were they doing it just because they knew that I enjoyed it, you know, just yeah. to share time. But, you know, they were all, they are all really good athletes and smart. It's just, as a dad, it, you know, it breaks your heart because it seems like 12 or 13 is the age. You know, you watch them, it's, it's like this. They go upstairs one day with gym shorts on, tennis <laughs> shoes, t-shirt, hair and a ponytail. They go up that way and they come down the stairs, a girl, yep. makeup on, uh, don't want to go fishing anymore. And that same day is when you go get your shotguns and right. put them by the door. <laughs> right. You know, it was, man, it was, it was tough doing what I do. It was hard to miss some stuff. I can remember, I remember this like it was yesterday, being on Wheeler once, fishing a tournament, practicing. I was, it was a hundred degrees being in the back of this creek and I got a phone call, uh, my oldest, and it's like, hey, just want you to know that, and I knew she was playing, she's playing in a, a softball state championship, and I knew she was playing, but Allie just hit a, a home run to win the game. And I'll never forget this. Like I, all right, like I couldn't even talk. I hung the phone up, and I sat right there behind the console where, where you are and just, cried my eyes out because it was it's something you know you hear about it but you, you weren't there to see it mm -hmm. you know out there doing what we do and and that was that's the biggest part that that I feel like I missed was some of those things I mean if I was home I was with them but it, you know you miss stuff like that and if it wasn't fishing dude if I was traveling around building barns or something I'd have quit 20 years ago yeah but fishing I mean it's you know, that's how we made a living. The bills. It's my job. Man, I, there's there's nothing in this world that's more important to me than them three kids. That's awesome. You man. know, we just like you, you got kids. Oh, you yeah. have your differences and stuff, but at the, at the end of the day, ain't nothing they're, more important. They're you. It's, like, it's just like your family bringing you up fishing. 
I mean, it's in your DNA, man. They're, they're, and I know they're proud of Dad, man. There's yeah. no doubt that they're proud of your accomplishments. Well, I, as proud as they are of me, wouldn't hold a candle to what they've done. I mean, they, you know, they. Well, you told me you're, so you got an eighth grader. Yeah. Won a state championship in basketball. Yeah, yeah they do. In Oklahoma, you know, we, they, they de dependent schools, which are K through eight, just like high schools, you know, state tournament. You know, all three of my girls won it. All three of my girls is all, all, tur all tournament team. Jason won it last week. And, and, uh, I was cool. I got to be there for all that. I actually flew home from Florida to watch the games and flew right back. But, that's awesome. Uh, Good now they, they shoot the three ball like man, that? Man, <laughs> man. I used to play, uh, we had a deal. If they beat me in horse, I'd give them $20. And that's pretty good till about fifth grade. And then it's over? Yeah, you gotta just do ice cream or something <laughs> like that. But they can, they can shoot. They can do everything. Smart, pretty. You Makes, better get more bullets. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Oh, I got a bow, and, a bow and arrow, and I like to shoot real dull broadheads. <laughs> What's one food you could never give up? Mex Ever? No Mexican food. Okay, well now what? So, so take me there. Is it a burrito? Fajitas. Fajitas, that's right. your move. Yeah, it's just gotta be, I mean, no matter, the cool thing about Mexican food, no matter where you're at in the country, it's all pretty much the same. I was gonna say, it's, it's consistent, yeah. right? Yeah, and it goes back to having kids, dude. Whenever you go into a restaurant with a four-year-old and a two-year-old, they don't want to sit 30 minutes and wait for the food to come out. You want to be eating something, keep mm -hmm. them busy. Chips and salsa. Yep. And then fajitas, can't beat it. Dude, having two boys, I, I feel you on that, <laughs> buddy. Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, the go-to is the cheese quesadilla. You get the, uh, for the kids, get the chips, the salsa, get a little cheese dip, keep them entertained, and they get you in and out. Right, right. All right, so you heard it here. If you want to treat this guy <laughs> to a nice dinner, fajitas it is. Yep. So you were a school teacher and a coach mm -hmm. before you made the leap mm -hmm. into pro bass fishing full time. But I want to take it back to when you were in school, what was your worst subject in school? What were you the worst at? History. History, yeah. okay. Well, what's funny is in school, history just wasn't interesting to me. Math was my best subject. I mean, okay. I could do math like this, but it's funny now that I'm out of school, obviously, history, you know, is like, I love history. I love- Hold your yeah, attention. Yeah, I love, but back then, history was just, it wasn't, it didn't, I wasn't entertained back then. <laughs> it, you know, it was, it was just slow. It was memorization and stuff, but uh, everything else I was pretty good at history. I had to sit by the smart people in history class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hate to bring this up, but you can't do a Jason Christie interview without bringing this up. So. When you go through all your stats, and I was on the bass page, and you've only had, out of all your wins, because you got several wins, you've had three second place finishes ever in Bassmaster competition, and only like four thirds. One of those seconds was a very famous tournament, the mm -hmm. Classic of Grand, and one of those thirds was, was at Hartwell. And basically in those two tournaments, it's it's like you were saying about the the FLW you were leaving for two hundred grand when mm -hmm. your uncle was there. Um, everybody had you just penciled in. It was those were Jason's tournaments. Right. When it didn't go your way, what's the process like for you after that? I mean, did it take months to get over it? Are you still not over it? Do you still think about it? Because we all know those are truly that, those classics were they're once in a lifetime opportunities, but. How did you how did you deal with that? That's a really tough question to answer because I mean I still obviously still think about it to this day. There's there's not many days that I, that I'm not reminded of it in some way. The grand one was a little easier to swallow because <clears throat> I mean Edwin just come out and smoked them. Caught a great big string Giant on the last bag day. on the last day and and uh, that was easier. I mean to handle. The one that really burns me is the one at Hartwell. I mean, because and it, the one at Graham wasn't my fault. I mean, yeah, somebody'd say it was. You got beat. Well, I, I'd had to catch. You did all you could. Yeah, do. I did all I could do. I mean, if if uh, if I would have went out and fished normal on the last day, not knowing that he had a big bag, I would I would have went and caught my twenty, and I'd have got beat by three or four. You know, I got beat no matter what. But the Hartwell one is the one that burns and. The reason that it burns is because that one was my fault. I had, you know, 
a really good deal going on and I knew I could catch them but I had a I had a little backwater that I felt like they were coming to. The first day I hit it late, caught a five and a six. The second day I hit it, lost a couple big ones. And I just convinced myself after that second night that they were gonna be there. Well, my other deal was a kind of a morning deal, you know? But I wanted it to, this is weird to say, I wanted it to be over quick. <laughs> and I thought it was gonna be over quick. You know, I was convinced and I've lost other tournaments by not changing you know doing the same thing and and I just man I made the wrong decision and dealing with it you know if you win one of those events it changes your life you know you win two of them I mean you go down in history that's right not many folks have done that yeah and I think what is hard to deal with is the first seven or eight or nine years of my career everything went my way you know you're you're in fourth going in the last day or you're leading going in the last day and you flip a five pounder and he hits the gun gunnel and comes in the boat and it seems like those classics when that all that went down you kind of start second guessing yourself you know that fish he doesn't come in the boat he, he gets caught way. you know he gets caught in the one twig that's this big and comes off and it just gets you it gets you thinking about what what could have been but I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. I'll tell you this, there's a lot of people that would have had a six pound lead at Hartwell that would have drove, you know, after that weigh in and they wouldn't have been able to deal with it. I mean, they'd, they'd have crumbled and I didn't and I haven't. It makes you a tough person. There's not anything that somebody can do to me that, I mean. You can uh, handle it. Right, I can handle it. I mean, it doesn't. Dude, I blew two six-pound leads in the Classic. Doesn't hurt me if I go out one day and don't catch one, because well, I've done worse. Well, and this is what I, I say to people, anybody that would be a critic of, well, yeah, man, Jason lost two Classics. Well, you were there, right? right? And there's so many people that were killed just for the opportunity to go into that last day, but there was something Zona said, because we were all watching, you know, working the show. Right. You know, y'all are out there competing. But, but I, I remember being there and watching it, and, and Zona, you can feel it slipping away from you that last day right. you, you couldn't but you knew it was tough right? right you knew it was tough on you and you're watching Ren Ayler catch him and you're watching all the guys really you know of course Jordan yeah has another comeback but you're watching this and Zona said he said Jason is doing what Jason does you said it exactly and here's the here's, and you went down swinging here's the thing whether I win or lose I went to bed that night knowing that I did it my way and people there's a few people that fish that know this. When you do it your way, whether you win or lose, you can lay your head on that pillow mm -hmm. that night and go to sleep. Now, here's, so imagine this for the critics. Say I go out there at nine o'clock. Yeah, I pick up a spinning rod. I go catch me 14 pounds, 15 pounds. Somebody beats me. Am I gonna sleep better that night getting beat doing what I do? Or doing something that somebody that's else not what you yeah. that's somebody else's deal yeah i mean it's a really good point i've won a, i've won probably more than i should have over the years and i've done it doing it my way and one thing about me is 10 years ago i done it my way i'm doing it my way now and when i'm done i'm gonna be doing it my way I'm that's not, what you enjoy yeah, that's I'm what's not, in your dna i'm not gonna do it anybody else's way and that's one of that comes from old duck you know you do it your way and and uh, if it's meant to be it's meant to be heck yeah so you're a gigantic deer hunter. I'll just say deer killer, because I feel mm. like you kill as many big bucks as anybody I know. What do you think the deal is with, you're a great fisherman, a great outdoorsman, what's that tie right there? Because you see guys, and I've mentioned them before, but the Andy Morgans and Wesley Straters, these guys, y'all are all the same. You're just great outdoorsmen, but what, why do you think that is? Well, the biggest reason is, is we fish for a living and we get to spend a lot more time in the woods. <laughs> so it's simple then, yeah. huh? You know, I uh, I think the biggest thing is my deer hunting is kind of like my fishing. Like I, if I know there's a big one around, I can go sit in one tree for four days and not see a deer, knowing that or hoping that that one that I want is going to come by. So your fishing mentality is just like your hunting mentality. Oh, yeah. Then. yeah, quality and, versus quantity. Oh yeah, and that's okay. you know I I just love it. I mean, deer hunting. That's just my, that's my piece. I get out there and 
dude, I can sit there for, I've, there's no telling how many days I've spent in a tree from daylight till dark. And just hoping that that one, you know, that one that comes by and that feeling, knowing whenever you see him coming, he's the one that you've been after and you got a bow and arrow in your hand and it's, you know, ain't, there's just nothing like it. And you don't use dull broadheads for the deer like nah. you do for the boys sharp that come ones, around. <laughs> sharp broadheads for the deer and dull ones, rusty for the boys. Dude, I appreciate you doing this. I hope you enjoyed this boat as much as I did because it brought back a bunch of memories for me. I know it did for you just hearing some of the stories you told and these old rangers are super cool. I grew up in it. I mean, uh, fishing stories, just family stories, the 300 series and the 400 series and the 500 series, just story after story. To where we're at now in these 520Ls, it looks like spaceships. It's yeah. crazy to think, but you don't need an $80,000 bass boat to go fishing. and. And, and you look at this boat, Mr. Myron Wood let us borrow this, and he's got it decked out with new grass, new trolling motor, and as long as it floats and yeah. it gets you there and back, that's really all you need. But what's crazy to think, though, is this bass boat in 1990 to 96 would cost you $21,000. That's <laughs> crazy. It's crazy to think, and now motors cost that. But, dude, thank you so much for doing this. Anytime. Boats and pros. As always, thank y'all for watching. If you like Boats and Pros, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that subscribe button. Drop us a comment below if you've got a cool boat that we need to see for an episode of Boats and Pros, and I'll see you next time.